Welcome to worship. This is our first Sunday in Advent. And I'm Pastor Terry. I'll be leading worship today. Pastor Liz is on vacation. We wish her and her family well and safe travels home. Well, with those prayers on our heart, I invite all who are able to stand and join in our opening song, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers, 244. God's house, everyone is welcome. Those who seem like they have it all together and those of us who feel like we're falling apart. No matter who we are, there's room for us here. With that confidence, we turn our attention to God in prayer, speaking the truth of our lives. God of today and God of tomorrow, you say, bring your full self. There's room for you here. But we say, our lives are too messy. You say, bring your hopes and your dreams. There's room for you here. But we say, it's too risky to hope. You say, bring your grief and your prayers. There's room for you here. But we say, sometimes are easier to forget. Forgive us for withholding our full selves from you. Help us remember today and tomorrow. There's room for every story. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ has forgiven you, has died for us, and forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> So 
let us pray. God of the ages, in scripture we hear stories of people like us, ordinary people who have longed to know and follow you, people who have made mistakes and people who have tried to grow and learn. These people were old and young, natives and immigrants, new to the faith and lifelong believers. In scripture, we hear stories of people like us, so let us walk with them and with you. Be with us here today. We are listening. We are grateful. We are yours. Amen. You may be seated. One of the great parts of, uh, for me, of the Advent season is the lighting of the Advent wreath. And we have a whole clan here today. Encourage them, all right? All right. There we go. Over 100 people from ages 2 to 80 were asked the question, what gives you hope? from the voices of different generations, hear their answers. My daughters. No, no. Dog, dogs wagging their tails. Talking with young people. Kindness from strangers. Spending time in the woods. Mm, waffles. <laughs> Hands held in prayer for medical research. Social progress. The way my daughters call everybody friends. The winging, the winging of torch bells. Babies trying over and over to take their first step. Oh, you make one. The turning of seasons. Christian community. Friendship with my adult children. Advocates for justice. Hearing children in the pews sing the hymns. The sunrise single moment. This church gives me peace. What gives you, I'm sorry, this church gives me hope. What gives you hope? Today we light the candle of hope to remind ourselves that God is at work in this world. From generation to generation, God has brought good news of love and compassion, justice and community. Let us rest and abide in that good news. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Share with each other a sign of peace. And peace to you all. The reading today is from Matthew, first chapter, verses 1 through 17 the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. <clears throat> An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. 
And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Selethiel, and Selethiel the father of Jerubabel, and Jerubabel the father of Abuid, Abiud, excuse me, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akam, and Akam the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph the husband of Mary, who bore Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Yeah. All right, I'll stand up here so everybody can kind of see and look on up here. So I made, what does that look like? A family tree. Does it look like a tree? Like a Christmas tree kind of? I put a star on top because I'm special. <laughs> See, right there. Okay, so I started with me and then I listed my mom and dad, Kathy and Steve, and then I listed their parents. So Carol and Merv, who are members here, and Margaret and George. And then I listed their parents, so Edna and James and Esther and Otis and Lenore and Frank and Avis and Charlie. So that bottom row would have been my great grandparents. Do you know your great grandparents? Maybe. You have a lot of great grandparents. I know, look at how many I have. Right down here. That's a lot. 20, mm, not quite 25. But in the story today, it talked about, no, no, not 26 either. It talked about Jesus's lineage. And it said that there were 14 generations from David to Jesus. So 14, I'm only at three from me. So I would, maybe I would have gotten to 26 by then if I did 14 generations. But as it was, I had to call my dad and ask some of these people's names because I didn't remember them all. Thankfully, he remembered. All right, so, but this family tree isn't all of my family. I don't have my brother and his family on there. I don't have my husband and our kids on there. I don't have his family. I don't have my aunts and uncles. If I did that, the tree would be enormous, right? So I want you to do something today. I want you to create a family tree. And you can add whoever you want to that family tree from your family. You can have aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas and brothers and sisters if you have them. And just see how big your tree is. All right, let's pray. Dear God, Dear God thank you for our family trees. Thank you for our family Help us to remember our lineage and where we came from. But most importantly, help us remember that we come from you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Danielle. You set me up just perfectly. You think we planned this. Um, so my mom loves studying our family lineage. It's to her like this puzzle to put together. 
And she has gone to the extremes. She went on a road trip with me once to Wisconsin, and we had to do this way out of the way trip to some cemetery and walked for about 45 minutes to find the family person that she headstone that she was trying to find. She's gotten my aunt into it, my dad's sister. So they're studying the Martinson side of me as well as her family, the Heskey side. And uh, they now can do stuff on computers. So they would spend hours finding the birth date of this or where this person immigrated to or when, you know, if they were married and what year they were married and how many kids they had. She has computer programs and books that she's printed this information out and she shares it with me and I kind of do what the kids did to Danielle and I kind of glaze over just a little bit after the third or fourth generation. I'm just kind of lost, right? But maybe because of that, she has put in our house this lovely array of photographs of each generation, kind of neatly organized, which is way more interesting. I loved your chart, Danielle, but it's way more interesting to see all these very stoic Norwegians and Swedes and Danes faces right on the wall in our house. For most of my life, these were strangers. They would tell me stories and I would kind of go right over my head. But as the years have passed, those strangers of Art and Carmen and Genevieve and Sophie and Robert and Olga, they suddenly now have meaning in my life. And in fact, some of their names have been repeated to different generations as we remember our family lineage. It is kind of weird, I will say, to go into my old family bedroom and look at all of these things on the wall. But it is nice to know the story of which I'm a part of. We're a pretty weird bunch. I don't imagine your families uh, are like that at all, right? Um, we're a faithful bunch, though, as well. My great grandpa was an itinerant preacher, uh, did it on the side. Um, other people, right, have been key in the community, starting churches and witnessing to this gospel story. Our story is filled with a bunch of joy and sorrow. There's a lot of laughter along the way. We don't take ourselves quite too seriously. I've gotten to know, because of my mom's hobby, a lot about my family and even pictures of the homesteads in Denmark and Sweden and um, uh, Norway and Canada. In today's story or reading, it really is just a list of names. If you were to write your list of names from your family, what names would come? What stories would be brought to mind? And how were those stories passed down? Our theme for this Advent season is generation to generation. And so ironically, it seems fitting I'm preaching today, literally 36 hours after returning from a week's trip to Norway, one of the countries of my ancestors. I have Norwegian ancestors on both my mom and dad's side and happened to be 50% Norwegian. This was uh, only my third trip to Norway. But each time that I have gone, I have this mixed uh, experience. It is both oddly familiar and foreign. It's foreign because I don't speak Norwegian. I don't understand a lot of their money system and the way that the church is a state church. It's very different in Norway. The way that they um, live and the, a lot of the way that they organize their life is very different than for us in the US. But there's also this odd sense of familiarity. I look down the street and I see familiar looking faces. I remember on one of my trips, I got off of the plane in Stavanger and I'm like, these are my people. 
they look like my ancestors. I've had conversations with colleagues there in a conference that I was at, and oddly, the stories they were telling of the things that they practice were familiar to me. I was surprised by that. My family taught me the sets of values and traditions that when I showed up in a country I had never been to, there was a sense of familiarity. There's different ways that those traditions and those values were passed down. I don't know about you, but food's not a bad one. We would make food at our house, especially this time of the year, that other families didn't make. Some of it I loved, others not so much. Each year at this time, Krumkaka and Lefsa had to be made. Certain songs would be sung. My one grandma had to sing her Swedish hymn to Connor, my Norwegian grandpa. I think that was a little bit of a, I'm gonna get the kids to know Swedish kind of thing going on there. But we also heard the stories from the farm and at Christmas experiences about what it was like in those early years of coming to the US. Each of these little activities, this food, these stories, these traditions, were all a part of a bigger commitment to pass on an appreciation for where we came from, for our family story to remind us that we're part of something bigger. Our gospel reading for today, this list of names, is just one of the ways that we're reminded that we are a people of faith that live from one generation to the next. It is just one part of passing on this legacy, this story, and thanks, Deb, for reading all those crazy names. I was like, I'm glad I'm not reading this. <laughs> Some of those names may be well familiar. People like Ruth and Jesse, David and Solomon and Amos. But some maybe were strange, were unfamiliar. Some played a significant part in history and some just were. The significance of that reading is not that you know all the names. The significance is that Jesus' lineage can be traced back to Jacob and Abraham. And for the Jewish people waiting for the Messiah, that was significant. For 42 generations, they passed down the faith. And that just got us to Jesus. It's been 2,000 years post to Jesus now, and countless generations, I didn't do the math, but we still are here today talking about this story, learning about what it is to follow this God in the world that God created. And just like I knew about the Norwegians before I ever set foot in Norway, Maybe we too are being called to know something about what it is to be a follower of God and who is this God that we're following that has been with us for all these generations. See, we worship and follow the same God as all of the people in the list. In this Advent season, we prepare for the coming of Christ and we commit ourselves every year at this time to tell the story. We tell the same story again and again. We do it here in worship. We do it through songs that we sing and stories we tell. We do it through activities that we do here together and in our homes and in the community. We do it through the ways that we gather and we slow down a bit 
and spend time with people that we love and care about. Why? Because it's a story worth repeating. It's a story that says, this is the God of whom we worship. This is the good news of God's love. Now in our world, Christmas is not necessarily a, Christmas, a Christian story anymore. In fact, watch any Christmas movie or an ad on television or the signs as you drive through the city, and they're often lacking one thing, Jesus. In a world that's commercialized Christmas, it's important to remember the origin of this season and not let that be overshadowed by all the hoopla that's around us. The root word for generation, gen, actually means origin or birth. And in this season, we're inviting you to get back to the core, to get back to the heart of the Christmas story. It's an amazing story that comes with an amazing truth God came to us. God put on flesh and walked on this earth so that we might know God's love. That's what the season is about. God took action first, and it's out of that action that we simply are called to continue to tell the story and to keep it alive from generation to generation. So this year, we're gonna tell the story of Jesus again. And we're gonna do it so you can recognize God's activity and God's character in the world and in our lives. But the other thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna hear each other's stories because our stories get grafted in to this bigger story. I'm part of that wall of pictures in my old bedroom and it doesn't end with me. Each person, each generation is part of this bigger story. I'm a newbie here at LCP, but I have it on good authority that there's a long legacy of Lutheran Church of Peace telling the story of Jesus. I've heard that. <laughs> and we continue to focus on that today. We do it in simple ways. We do it through the focus on relationships for reaching out to people in need, for praying for each other and the people that are important to our lives. We do it through the music that we sing and the scripture that we dig into. We do it through reaching beyond the doors of this building and of welcoming people into our lives. We could make a list of all the people at LCP that have shared God's love over the years. I think it would be a pretty long list. Some of us here would know a lot of people on that list. Some of us wouldn't know many, but this we do know. We're here today because of all of those people that have shared the good news of this story. Their faithful witness allows us to be here today. It's not the size of the act or the impact of the things that they did, it's that they continued to tell the story and to witness to God's love in the world. I'm part of a sandwich generation. I get to see my kids being adults, making their way in the world. And I get to accompany the elders in my family in their last chapters of life. It is a beautiful and hard place to live at times. 
I see new dreams and I hear lots of gratitude. I see unfulfilled goals and hardships that live alongside creativity and imagination. And in the midst of it all, I see potential. Potential for rich, meaningful conversations, for big and small acts of generosity and kindness, and for valuing the people in our lives way more than the accomplishments that we've, that we've done in the world. Each of those is the potential to witness to God's love in both familiar and new ways. Next Sunday, I get to preside at my aunt's funeral in Seattle. At 82, she's lived a long and faithful life. She's not, she doesn't have a big bank account. She's never held a fancy title. But she has been a woman of faith that has witnessed to God's story in the midst of a lot of hardship in a family that often goes to shame and in the midst of people that have made strangers become family. She has been a witness to God's love and mercy. And even to the day she died, she was struggling with what of she had been given she should keep and pass on and what needed to be let go of. She lived in a different time and place. And there are parts of the Christian community that were very hurtful in her lives. And yet she has committed herself to be an agent of healing and love. She knows that God comes to us in the midst of messiness. And God's one big resounding message is I love you more than you'll ever imagine. So I ask you in this holiday season, what message do you wanna pass on? Will you be willing to be part of this community willing to witness to the good news that God is with us. God comes into our lives and wants us to know we are loved more than we can imagine. This week, I invite you to think of one person who has passed down the faith to you. I invite you to reach out to them and say thank you. Amen. Amen. On the moon.
stand as you're able and join me in the statement of belief. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. God of Abraham and Isaac, Mary and Joseph, thank you for being faithful to the people we read about in the Bible. Their stories remind us of how faithful you have been from generation to generation. Thank you for their witness to your grace and mercy. Each of us also have people in our lives that have made your love come alive for us. We are grateful for parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles and mentors who have passed faith on to us. Embolden us to join this ever-growing community of believers who tell others about your love and pass on your story to another generation. Lord, in your mercy. God, you care about every story and make room for every story within your story. You encourage us to do the same. When we encounter stories that are different from ours, Show us how to add chairs at the table. When we find ourselves reacting to stories that frustrate and test our patience, show us how to build bridges instead of walls. When we hear stories that feel foreign or unrelatable, remind us to open our hearts and fully listen to these, your beloved children. Lord, in your mercy. God, Emmanuel, you came into this world to meet us in our everyday broken world. Thank you for caring about each of our lives and for inviting us to be a part of your family. Thank you for seeing our ordinary selves, selves that are anxious, have unflattering habits, and fixate on things we cannot change, and inviting us into your big dream. 
Thank you for seeing our scattered thoughts, our imposter syndrome, and our fragments of doubt, and redirecting us to focus on your never-ending love for us. Thank you for seeing our fragile ego, egos and uncertain relationships and letting us know we belong here, in this place and in this time. Help us to see others the way you see us and let our lives be instruments of peace. Today, we see the needs and concerns of this community and we lift them up to you. We pray for the family and friends of Lori Engesser as so many of us mourn her death. Let us also celebrate her life and witness to your unfailing love. We also ask you to lay your healing hands on those that are recovering from surgery. Jessica Telstead, Brian Fisher, Anita's friend Mary, and Sue McIntyre. May they continue to heal and recover. We also ask you to pray for Sean and his family and friends as they come to you with prayers and concerns as he was recently diagnosed. They're coming to you with the what's and what's next and why. Be, for their, be there for them and answer their prayers. We ask that you be there for all who mourn this holiday season, especially Dave's family and his wife, June Co. We pray for the IDs who are returning today and ask for their safe travels. And while this beautiful snow falls around us, it can also cause troubles while traveling. So we pray for Andrew Swanson, who spent last night in the ER after totaling his car. Help him recover physically, emotionally, and financially. Turn his trials and tribulations into peace and security. Clear the obstacles from his path and help him always know that when life seems out to get him, your compassionate arms always safely surround him. Lord, in your mercy. God, as we anticipate gathering with friends and family and begin preparing our homes for this Christmas season, show us how to be a good host. You invite us to your table each week, and with this simple meal of bread and wine and arms outstretched, you declare that there is always room for more in this house and at this meal. You want us to come as we are. You see each of our stories with our particular gifts and needs, and you weave us together into a community that offers hope for the world. Give us a taste of that promise today as we eat this meal within this community. Release the fears that hold us back and send us home assured in your presence. All of this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now as we prepare to come to God's table, hear these words. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread. After giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Eat this and remember me. In a similar way, after supper, he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to all his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And now let's pray together in the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. For those of you that are worshiping online, the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. For those of you that will be communing here, we will begin on the side aisles from the front to the back, and then we will move to the center section from the back to the front. There's a gluten-free station on my right. Um, come, for the table is now ready.
Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you've united us with Christ. Make us one with all your people. And now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite all who are able to stand to join in our closing hymn, Love Has Come, hymn 292. Now go with this blessing. As we leave this place, go knowing that from generation to generation, you have been claimed and loved. From generation to generation, God has been by our side. From generation to generation, we are not alone. The God of yesterday and the God of tomorrow knows each of you by name, loves you and calls you forth saying, go be the people you're called to be. Love wildly, do justice and come back soon. May it be so, amen. amen.